in my memory. Got it. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another installment of our Ask the Editor series. Um, Richard and I were just in the midst of a conversation, so I just hit record and um, I just want to pick up on that. Um, we were talking about how lit mags might be affected by supply chain issues um, this fall. So, sorry, I think I cut you off mid-sentence, but did you? <laughs> Um, I'm here with Richard Peabody, editor of Gargoyle, um, and so one of the concerns is that there might that we don't have paper. We're going to run out of paper. Well, you don't because you don't have you have the drivers of the big trucks and the big rigs are all. A lot of them are dying, I guess, mm -hmm. and some of them are quitting because they're going. Oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. Yeah. And uh, and the the man I was talking to yesterday was telling me that he thought a lot of it has to do with you know, because they're going to have longer hours now and not have days off to be with their families like they would have in this backup, um, they're quitting and they're doing things like driving for Amazon because that's quick wow. and go home. Um, so it's, but it's, it's like, again, dominoes all the way down the supply chain. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, you know, I have a couple of things that are going to be printed this fall and I haven't really looked into that in personally yet. But I have friends who are totally freaking out about the whole issue of whether there'll be paper. Um, and then if you're in the delivery chain, you know, getting your books delivered to you after they're printed, getting them delivered to bookstores. I mean, the other day I sent something to Amazon um, in New Jersey. They'd ordered a bunch of books. And uh, it, it was interesting because the post office, you know, the, the thing comes up on the, on the postage and it says, oh, their New Jersey warehouse has been flooded. So the mail won't be there for a week or so. And I'm like, what? You know, it's, I've never heard of that. I right. just, the things that are happening are so sci-fi. It's right. just, wow, okay. So um, does Gargoyle typically print in the fall and will these paper issues and printing issues affect your magazine? Oh, they're going to affect me this year because we're delayed. We have... Um, I mean, it is, it's been a totally unpredictable two years and, right. and something always happens. So when the initial lockdown started, um, the people who, uh, my need of Congress who does all my uh, desktop and, and design um, said yes to every job basically for the money because she was worried. And, uh, and all those deadlines come down right. and I'm the art rate. <laughs> So, um, because I'm the art rate, I'm last in the line mm. and, and writers don't understand that. It's like, you know, so I've been getting, uh, probably two emails a day. And I think the two issues I have in the can are both about 500 pages. They're monsters. Mm -hmm. Um, one was supposed to come out around this past Labor Day and then Memorial Day, and it's still not out. Now we're looking for this Labor Day. Um, and we missed that too. Um, but it's almost in galleys. I've, I've seen the whole layout. Um, so will it be paper? I don't know, but it's just sort of one more thing. I mean, it sounds like you're making it up, you know, like vampires stole my lunch money. That's why I'm <laughs> this year. But actually this year has been trying and I know a lot of people have quit. Yeah. Um, and I've thought about it. Um, and I've also thought about, you know, I could just do away with all this, just be, becoming a online zine. Screw it. Right. You know? Uh, I mean, I get the almost simplicity of that, uh, but I've always been in love with print mm -hmm. and uh, it's hard to let go. Yeah, yeah. And it's worth mentioning here, uh, when I think of Gargoyle, I think, so I have a Gargoyle here. I think this is from 2011 yeah. and it is just, it is a huge lit mag. So when you say 500 writers, you're not exaggerating. I mean- No, I said pages, not 500, 500 pages. writers, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I could have, yeah, well, if you have several poems by the same, yeah, but, um, right, that would have to be one page <laughs> per writer, but um, it's a hefty journal, it really is, so you have 500 pages um, for two journals that are backed up, and that's a lot of work, so uh, I can understand writers being frustrated but they but, don't know. But not as frustrated as I am. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> it's it's really useful for writers to know. Um, and I've asked other editors, there seems to be a range because some red editors say we haven't really been that affected. 
Um, and some mm -hmm. editors say, particularly the ones that rely on funding from universities, they seem yeah. to be very affected um, and some don't know the future of their magazines. So it's really useful to hear that like editors are not just delaying because they're slow and they're distracted and they're not interested. <laughs> there are all these things going on and you know the truck deliveries and Amazon warehouses flooding and all these other things going on that prevent um, the journals coming out and the reading of submissions in like a timely way. And plus just all the real world stuff that's going on, which yeah. is making everyone burned out and crazy too. Yeah. Um, man. And then, and then I was talking to someone last night at, we, we had an event last night and, uh, and they said that they don't believe that the university MFA programs will ever go back to the way they were. Mm -hmm. And I was curious about that because so instead of having to pay people to be like this super duper staff, you know, you don't need to do that anymore because you can do it all on Zoom. Yeah. So now what's happening is MFA programs are bringing in all kinds of big names from all over the world to teach online. And that changes everything. Mm -hmm. That's going to be interesting because I because so much of um, what was important to me in my English program was interaction, personal interaction. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. I mean, there's so many changes happening. It's hard to, you know, we should yeah. all just be eating popcorn. It's <laughs> <laughs> watching what happens. Right. Um, but I, I do, um, I do like the, the, the print uh, world. And, you know, I, I used to joke and say that, you know, you, that, that the hit you get from that smell of the fresh ink is just amazing. And, mm -hmm. and nothing tops your first issue. And even if it just is typo on every page and it, doesn't matter it's the first mm -hmm. one so well this is sort of a segue this is going to be one of my final questions but i can actually push it to the front is sort of uh what keeps you going in the lit mag work because it's especially now i mean it does seem like it would be more convenient to switch to online publishing only um and then even maybe cutting back on some of your responsibilities and but but so what at the end of the day keeps you as an editor and keeps you wanting to do this work. Wow. Well, I suppose it's an addiction. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I love um, discovering new people mm -hmm. um, that I think are really good. And, and, and uh, the first book we ever did was because we, we had done a fiction anthology and some eons ago. And uh, we did, did a whole issue of fiction. And at the last minute I got like, an incredible story by a guy named Michael Brondoli, um, who later went on to have a book published uh, in New York and sort of disappeared. He's still around. Um, he's a great writer. Um, and I'd found him through um, Bruce McPherson, who uh, is McPherson and Company Books and, and used to be, I, I love the missing names from the 60s, Treacle <laughs> Press. I love that that's what it was. Just like uh, uh, Coffee House was originally Toothpaste Press. I love the old names. Um, and, uh, I, when it, when that manuscript arrived, I said, well, this, I have to publish this because it's that good. I have to do this. And you don't feel that way about everything. When I mean, you go, well, oh, this is really good. I like it. You know, it should be in the magazine. But when you get one of those that is just, oh my God, this is perfect. Mm -hmm. We, that was our first book. We did it as a book and we were so happy. Um, so, I mean, it's still fun. And it, when I started Gargwell, I, I went around to all the guys who had magazines in the Washington area in the 60s, because um, I, I came in mid 70s. And uh, I said, why did you quit? And they all looked at me, laughed. And it was like, <laughs> I said, it stops being fun. Mm. And, 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 you know, getting hammered by everybody because of the last two years is like, that's not fun. And, yeah. and, I, and I, when I quit in 1990 for a while, I quit because it wasn't fun anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. it was all just a drag. People were just slamming you. And, I, and, and it's not the people who have been doing this. It's the new people who don't know. Mm -hmm. and, they, I mean, I, and I understand that. I was a new person, a newbie. I was a newbie once. And uh, you know, I, I, I used to complain that there weren't enough young writers being published. And people who are my age now would go, what 
<laughs> so, yeah. It's usually so I get the opposite it. that I hear. Yeah, well, and that's, and it's, that's one of the reasons I actually love Jane Austen, because if you read her when you're a newbie, you have one opinion. And then you right. read her when you're older, you go, oh my God, it all just shifted focus. So it's, uh, yeah, it's fun. So as long as it's fun, and uh, you know, I'd like to get these two issues out. Um, I have another uh, audio thing I'd like to do. Um, and then I'm, and maybe, you know, with two kids in school, maybe it is time to uh, face reality and mm. all, all in the online. But every time I think about that, something comes up, so who knows? Yeah. It's still fun. And again, uh, one of the things about AWP is I get to see all those guys from the 60s, like uh, Sasa Safransky from The Sun and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, and, and I miss Alan Kornblum uh, from Coffee House. He was a great guy. And, yeah. And I still see Bruce and, you know, all these guys who were doing it when I started. So that's yeah. the history of it is always fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I neglected to mention at the beginning, but if anyone has any questions, feel free to type them into the chat and I will work them into the conversation. Um, so cool. can you actually talk about the beginning of Gargoyle? Um, you guys started in 1970? Six. 1976. 1976. Um, um, and yeah, and what was the vision of the magazine at the time? Uh, well, uh, we were three frustrated writers mm -hmm. and, uh, and my friend Rusty's marriage had just collapsed. And uh, he wanted to be a photographer. And, and the other two guys, Paul Pascarella and Russell Cox, both worked at um, Brentano's in Friendship Heights, which is right on the district line with Maryland. And uh, unbeknownst to us, there was another literary magazine starting in a bookstore a block away, which is pretty funny, actually. Um, but uh, we were frustrated. No one would publish us. We were, you know. I didn't even get into the creative writing program when I was in grad school because I mean the creative writing classes because the woman in charge said, "Well, this is you know pedestrian." And mm. I was like, "What?" <laughs> so, so I was like, "I'll show you." you know? <laughs> um, so we we did the first issue. I had a my dad had a friend uh, in the Plains, Virginia, quite a trek, who was um, um, worked at a printer, uh, the, the newspaper printer. And so we went down there and uh, we had a friend from uh, uh, the uh, Brentanos, uh, Lynn Sheridan, who uh, knew how to do layout and design. We didn't know anything. And we went down there and it was all, you know, wax and pasting up uh, pieces of paper and doing the whole thing. And then you watch those big presses run. That was amazing. And then there was an issue. And uh, so we did it like it was, uh, like Rolling Stone, it was very small. It wasn't many pages, but so you could open it, you know, and read it like like newsprint, and uh, that was fun. And mm -hmm. uh, we did one a month, and they were a quarter piece, and everyone just wow. stole them because they were a quarter. Um, but the word qu quickly filtered out, and and originally we had put up hand drawn, you know, little pieces of paper saying, you know, we're reading for a magazine called Gargoyle. And uh, at Georgetown University in Maryland and all around town. And, and uh, the first poet we ever heard from was Jim Daniels. No way. That was absolutely amazing. And, you yeah. know, I've known Jim for the whole time. And it's just like, wow, he was just visiting somebody on campus right. and saw the ad. And, uh, you know, and you look back at the ad, it's really amateur, just, you know, kids drawing. It's just, God. And then the name came about because I had a notebook full of names and uh, we couldn't agree on anything. <laughs> and we finally, oddly enough, and it's gone now, but there was a there was a statue of Pan, you know, in front of the herb cottage at the Washington Cathedral. And they took it away. When I finally wanted in later in life to go look at it again, it's gone. Um, but it was impossible to get a shot of. And Rusty, the photographer, was trying. And, we had screens behind it and we were trying to hold them and stand around. So when he was bored while we were trying to get it all set up, he started taking pictures of all the gargoyles on the cathedral. Yeah. And when we saw the, you know, the sheets, uh, the photo sheets, it was all, uh, the gargoyles stood out. Mm -hmm. Pictures of Pan were terrible. So we switched the name to Gargoyle. 
that's how that happened. Yeah. And uh, and word spread. I mean, and that's all you know, pre-internet. So mm -hmm. word has spread slowly, but it did mm -hmm. spread. And and we had, I met people here who knew people in England, and so we got to publish um, Pete Brown and uh, some of the other writers there. It was just, it was a blast. Yeah. And and I think that whole feeling was very much like the net was again so to link up with everybody mm -hmm. that's what the small press world was like mm -hmm. when i am because we all started trading magazines so in a lot of ways you'd know people in foreign countries better than you knew the poets in your own town yeah and that was that was interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and was it always a really large journal or is that something that's no no because really those small? those those newsprint pages you know they were tall and opened but they they were they probably only about 12 20 pages something like that and then it the design changed all the way through the history because we for a while we were like a chapbook size and then we got thicker and then we started doing audio issues and you know i always joked that someday i would be assassinated by a crazed librarian because you can't bind them together they they look like broken teeth on, uh. on, on. i did one that was wide be, um, mm. because you couldn't print horizontal art without shrinking it in the vertical setup. So I thought, well, I'll do that. And it was the most expensive issue we ever did. I had no idea. And I thought, I thought you just took an eight by 10 page and turned it this way, you know, turned it that way and bound it here. No, it's much more difficult than that apparently. And it cost a fortune. And I just thought, well, I'm never doing that again. Yeah. Um, but, I, and, and so much of it is the learning process. We, we had a, the, that first book, Michael Brandelli's book, was bound at um and they when they put it i mean anything can happen they put it in the uh the trimmer we, and so they stack them up about 10 high and the, the blades come down like that mm -hmm. and trim it but they didn't tighten it enough so they slid so every book was a different shape it was absolutely you looked at them and just went what you know <laughs> so, so it was always something but, but that's what that's what publishers talk about. We talk about, oh my God, the ink, the the binding, that you know, there's always right. something. And was um, this all that was happening in the 70s as you were yeah, 70s, 70s into, it. into it. so it's so it's happening around the same time that punk rock is starting. Uh yeah. This with all the do-it-yourself mags. Right. That's that's when I come in. Right. Which is funny because I'm you know, I'm an old hippie. So it came in just and changed immediately. Right. Yeah. Right. So, and then at what point did it evolve into this like hefty monster? <laughs> I, I guess that's been since um, print on demand printing, really. Okay. Um, we did we did uh, three fiction anthologies in um, the '80s, mm -hmm. and they were just I, I was imitating the uh, New American Review. They mm -hmm. had the same kind of layout, mm -hmm. but they were thicker, and uh, I put probably about twenty or thirty. Uh, fiction writers. It was excerpts from novels, and because mm -hmm. very few people publish excerpts from novels, and I don't have a problem printing a chapter. Um, and they're, you know, and I think I had a play in one and stories, and it, it was it was a lot of fun to do, and it got more attention than anything we'd ever done up to that point. Yeah. Um, uh, I know one of them was reviewed by, uh, uh, God, name's gone, reviewer at the New York Times now. Oh, when he worked for the East Village Eye, he reviewed one of our books and it was so cool. Mm. Um, but I mean, you know, Village Voice, East Village Eye, uh, all the city papers, uh, yeah. all the, you know. So they, you, they, right now, Gargoyle publishes fiction, poetry, nonfiction. And nonfiction. And, and, uh, and some art. And, but, you know, the most difficult process thing in this process right now yeah. is the art. Yeah, because you have a whole generation of kids who grew up with cell phone cameras, yeah. and all those pictures they took until the new phones now aren't high res enough to print in print, and they didn't know that. Right. No one told them that. Right. So, right. <clears throat> so I sort of, you know, I, I don't know. I, I go on a treasure hunt on the web and. I find some cool art and I go, God, this is great. This make a great cover. And I, and I write them, uh, email them and they say, Oh yeah, yeah, I'd love that. That's great. You know? And, and, uh, you know, 
will I get copies? And yeah, of course. And uh, you know, it's, and then I give it to, to the designer and, and she and the printer kind of get together and go, uh, this won't work. Wow. See, can you get one that's more than 300 DPI? And then you go back to the photographer and you go, hey, can I get it 300 DPI? And they go, huh? You know, and you're, uh, so I've lost covers. I mean, really great covers. Yeah. And one reason to do an online magazine would be just to use those covers that I didn't get to use. Right. Um, and there's a lot of them. And it happens almost every time now mm -hmm. where you go, I, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Yeah. It won't work. And they don't comprehend that. But but the new, I know the new iPhones, man, they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're good. Yeah. Cool. And I'm allowed to use that symbol anymore. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, uh, they're, they're great. Um, and, and it, 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 so maybe it'll change now. Um, mm -hmm. I'll find some stuff. Yeah. Have you thought about printing a smaller magazine to save printing costs and save some headache maybe? Well, one of my frustrations is that I don't really, you know, I'll take the work and, and we pretty much read in our really short window now. Um, I mean, I joke, and there's one magazine that only reads on New Year's Eve. That's it. You send your work on New Year's Eve. I love that idea. <laughs> Which magazine uh, is that? But, but I, I, no, I can't, I can't remember who they are, oh, but, okay. but, but I read it, in, 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 and I just went, what? That's got to be a joke. Right. Um, but we read for, <laughs> and we read differently, I think, than a lot of magazines do. We, we tell you when the start date is, and we have a sort of floating closing date unless we're full. And we fill in a week, two weeks, just, you know, and I can fill a 500 page issue in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So immediately wow. everyone goes, well, obviously you have no editorial instincts at all. And you just take everything. And no, 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 we do not take everything. We reject tons of people. Um, but it's, uh, yeah. So, I, because I'm not on the design end and I know nothing, I'm not a tech guy at all. It is very difficult for me to envision how long a story is going to be in print. Hmm. Um, so what I would in my in my perfect world, uh, Nita would have a setup so that I'd take a poem and an issue, you know, a story, and she would plug them in. So I would know how many pages I have left. Hmm. And without that ability, I tend to go overboard. Hmm. And, so the only other option is just not to tell people when it's coming out at all, which would really make them all mad. Yeah. And just say, hey, it's coming out in the next year or two in one of the issues. I don't know which one. Right. Um, but because of the frustration everyone's feeling, um, we now have the next two issues, the ones that are in the can waiting um, up on our website Okay. with the whole complete table of contents. Because everyone's like, well, which one am I in? Right. And they're not out yet. But the minute you put up the table of contents, everyone starts trying to buy it. It's not even in galleys. Oh. <laughs> and, I th and I think, I and mean, I used to joke and say that um, in, these, in these days of instant gratification, instant gratification is too slow. Hmm. Because as you know, you could write a poem tonight, send it out, and have it published by tomorrow right. on an online mag. Right. And it takes me a year, because it takes me a year to come up with the money to print the thing. Hmm. And that's, you know, I'm not rich. It's mm -hmm. just part of the process. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a bunch of questions here. One is, um, how did you discover Lucia Berlin? The what? <laughs> Lucia Berlin? Oh, 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 Lucia Berlin. Um, I was at a bookstore. Um, I used to make these car trips across the U.S. and stop in uh, uh, independent bookstores and uh, go shopping and see if they'd buy some of our stuff. And of course, the, some of the big stores were fantastic to us and, and some of the little stores that I never heard of and never heard of again. Um, but we walked into a store, I think in Connecticut, um, just an odd store and somebody there had her books out on the table from the, from the small presses that had originally published her books. And there were like two little tiny, it was a pink book and there was a, another book and we bought those. And uh, my, my uh, literary partner then, Gretchen Johnson, started reading it in the car and she was blown away. She's blown, she goes, listen to this, you know? And uh, so we sought her out. Um, and uh, I guess we were early on in that, not on the West Coast, because they knew about her, 
but uh, on the East Coast, yeah, for sure. Remember that? Remember that? It's like that, that the way things used to travel. Uh, I remember when uh, incense and peppermints was a big hit on the West <laughs> Coast, and it took a year to get to the East Coast. I remember I was in England when Bowie's Ashes to Ashes came out, and it took like six months to get to the East Coast of America. And now it's overnight. Right. And that changes everything. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, she was great. And uh, we published one of her stories and ran an interview with her. And uh, it is heartening, uh, very much so, to see the, the big collections of her work now coming out. Uh, I know that Black, what was a Black Sparrow had done a couple of volumes of hers. Um, but it, it, getting her rediscovered again is very cool. She was neat. I liked her. That's great. Um, so another question, can you say more about how it stops being fun for you? Um, and is it, um, there's sort of a lot to this question, but is it, do you think from a lack of understanding in some way from writers of what the editors are going through on their end and maybe not targeting their work specifically to the journal close enough and being impatient? And you mentioned sort of you were getting slammed. Um, so is it, you know, does the burnout come from like the demands from writers or does it come from your own internal pressure? Um, and how does it just sort of stop being something that is pleasurable to work on? Oh, I think it all comes to a head. I mean, mm -hmm. the best selling issue we ever had, uh, we never saw a dime from because uh, B. DeBoer folded. They went down with all their money. Um, what was it that folded? The, was this a distribution? The distributor who was yeah. uh, Bernhard de Boer. And okay. uh, when they went down, that just killed us for a while. Yeah. Um, and, that's, and the tendency of going with someone like uh, one of the big shots is you have to print so many copies because they want to distribute them in all the stores. And if it doesn't sell and they send them all back to you, you <laughs> what are you going to do? Yeah. Uh, you didn't sell them, um, and that happens. Um, but I, I think that with the writers, I mean, I've never had any trouble. I mean, established writers, people with books out, people who've been doing this a while, they don't have any expectations whatsoever of you. Mm -hmm. And it has blown my mind completely. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we wrote Bukowski and asked him for work and he sent it. He didn't have a problem with that. You know, you know publish it, don't publish it, whatever. Um, because they're used to it all. And, right. and a lot of the new writers, you know, they want to get published right now because, yeah. you know, trying to make a name for myself. And because I'm older now, it's like my idea of time has shifted. Like, you know, oh, that was five years ago. It's like yesterday. Uh, but when I was a younger writer, five years was impossible to imagine. Um, it's, I think that's part of it. Um, yes, a lot of people don't read the magazine. They just want to be in it and they have no idea what we're doing. Um, we are, um, we, we, we were different in that we, we read um, and had published and, and even write both realism and totally experimental work. Um, and in, in the rest of the world, that's the way it works. But in America, for some reason, it's polarized like everything else. Mm -hmm. And there's always been a, hey, you know, I'm a realist and, you know, experimental writers should be, you know, exiled. <laughs> you know, it's just, <laughs> It's like both sides hate each other and, right. and I hate that polarization, but that's changed a lot now because of all the, the hybrid stuff and mm -hmm. the, the work of people who are, um, who are really, you know, crashing all the, the genres together. And I think that's glorious. I mean, I um, just, it makes it feel fresh and, and that's good for me. Uh, and I'm always looking for that kind of work. Um, and we're doing more translation. I think there's more translations happening now than there were since the sixties. Um, and that feels really good too. But I, you know, it's just, I think it's just too demanding. They're, everyone wants to get an email back from me. And, you know, I look at my email and there's like 50 people writing me and I just go, I don't, know, I don't have the energy anymore to write yeah. 50 people. Um, in the beginning, we would critique manuscripts in that, you know, you would send me a story and I would say, hey, you know, cut the last two pages and I'll take it. And they'd go, what? You know, and, 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 and I, as I told my, told my students, it, it's like, you know, so you cut the last two pages and they print it 
And then when you collect them in a book, you put the other two pages back on. You don't have to do, you know, you just want to be in the magazine. You don't right. care. I don't know. But everyone has issues. And uh, some people don't have any issues, I guess. But uh, but uh, everyone has, a, you know, the, the, the line they'll die for. So I don't know. I mean, I just, I want to have fun. I don't, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, it, the people who've been doing it a long time realize there's no money in it. Yeah. No, you know, and the people who don't think they're going to get rich. Right. And just, you know, and I used to say I, I would always have a student or two who wanted to be, you know, Stephen King by tomorrow. Yeah. You know, it's like, no, that's not going to happen right. unless you're connected beyond imagining. And that has a lot to do with it, too. Mm -hmm. And that it frustrates people. It's all frustrating. It's like, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, I know from the writer's side, it's interesting to hear you talk about the emails because I know from the writer's side of things, something that frustrates me the most is the lack of communication. And you can understand perfectly well that editors are swamped and they're overwhelmed. Um, but like I had a story that was supposed to come out at the beginning of the pandemic. And then they said, oh, it's, it was an online magazine. Um, and then they said, oh, it's gonna come out in three months. And then it was six months. And then I just stopped hearing from them. And so there's like the frustration of like not knowing, you know, and it's on the other side, it's a frustration from the editors because they're totally overwhelmed sometimes. And I think from the writers, it's like that feeling of um, what's going on? <laughs> Where's my work? Is it coming out? I don't know what, you know? And so everybody's sort of, I think it's one of those situations where everybody's like waiting to hear from somebody else and it just gets kind of messy. I try to, keep the website up to date so that people know what's going on. Yeah. But we have an old website that's also still alive. Mm -hmm. And people go to the old website and freak out. And you know, it's like, well, you don't have the right website. Yeah. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, it's but and that kind of thing has oh I, I wanted to share this one with you. This an anecdote uh, from the early days of Gargoyle. Um, I had had a poem that was accepted and a year and a half had gone by and I was freaking out like everyone does. And and I said, so I, I called, I found the number of mm -hmm. this poet and I, I called the magazine and a man answered and he said, oh, and I said, well, you know, I, can I have the poems back or whatever, you know, let me know. And he goes, you know, my wife and I got divorced and she left all this stuff here when she ran away <laughs> and I really don't care. And I went, gotcha. Oh, wow. Life goes on and it doesn't yeah. have anything to do, you know, and like maybe your editor died. Yeah. COVID, you know, there's no way yeah. to know. Yeah. And, I, and the frustration is not knowing. Right. right? Absolutely. But, That's the thing. I think also some writers don't realize how long it takes for a journal issue to come out. So you think you get a piece accepted and then sometimes you don't realize that it's not going to be published until two years down the line. So you're calling and you're thinking like, did the editor die or did they go through a divorce and my you know they don't care anymore or is this just normal you know so it's it's really useful to hear the editor's side of things because you just you as a writer you don't know <laughs> what's going on and it's sometimes two years feels like so long because you don't realize yeah. that's actually standard for a lot of magazines the last two years have been an eternity <laughs> well yeah um, sometimes two years feels like a decade <laughs> But but and if you sold a if you sold if your agent sold a book today yeah. to the New York book world, you wouldn't see galleys on that book for a year. Right. And when you saw those galleys, I love this part of the publishing business. You get like a letter that says, We need this back in 48 hours. Right. So you have to drop everything, sit down and read those right. galleys. And a lot of people go, Well, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and I have another example of the way things work differently in the indie press than in the New York world. Um, we always send copies to um, editors at, you know, William Morris, places like that, hoping that some of these people would be discovered. Mm -hmm. And one day when I also co-owned a bookstore for a while in the 90s, I got a call. And it was like, yeah, you know, what's going on? And they're like, hi, we're with William Morris and we're looking for this writer that you published. We'd like to offer him a contract for a book. And you're like, what? Okay, uh, let me get his information. I'll, I'll get right back to you. And I called him 
And he started laughing and he said, this is a joke, right? And I went, no, he goes, you realize I'm getting married tomorrow. <laughs> and this is callous and harsh, but I said, you know what? They've never called me. They've never called Lucinda, who was right. my partner then with the bookstore. Postpone the wedding. <laughs> is your manuscript done? He goes, well, it's not, and it needs to be tweaked. I'm like, yeah. tweak it. <laughs> tweak it now. Because in a month from now, they won't even remember who you are. Wow. He went, oh, you know, I'll do it after the honeymoon. And like, nope. Yeah. He blew it. And like, how many chances do you actually get? Right. And you have to make a decision. Yeah. And now, would she have understood? I mean, like, would Zelda have understood Fitzgerald at that moment? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's, and, and I'm not saying that we're all F. Scott, I just, mm -hmm. or Zelda. I yeah. just, we're, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I'm not going to change my life to, to jump when they say jump, right? right? But sometimes you got to jump. You got to seize the opportunity. And that, you know, he's never had another opportunity. Oh, wow. And you always think, well, you know, okay. Right. Yeah. Um, so we have a comment from someone whose short fiction is going to appear in issue 74, and it's her first publication. Congratulations. That's wonderful. <laughs> um, so this person says, thank you to Richard. And she's also curious to hear about your philosophy of accepting work as you read it and like it versus rejecting a good story because an issue is already filled. Um, so do you ever, as you're reading, uh, have enough work for an issue and then reject incoming work? That's it, yeah. yeah. And that's hard. So I don't read the incoming work that comes after because I don't want to be in that position. So you'll close submissions. At yeah, that I just close it. Yeah, I think that's, um, the most ethical thing to do. I've talked with other editors about this and I it really surprises me that any editor would actually stay open for submissions after they've already decided that their magazine is full. Um, so if you have enough submissions and you're ready to go, I think, yeah, turning off submissions makes the most sense. Well, you 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 know, you do want to publish good work and you mm -hmm. you that's what you're looking for, of course, mm -hmm. but but because of the way we read, we accept and reject as we go. It's not like a contest where you sit on everything for a month and then you make your decisions. We actually, nope, yep, nope, yep. And the ones that wait the longest are, I've always told my students, there's three piles. There's the, this gets rejected immediately. This gets accepted immediately. And this is the maybe pile. Mm -hmm. And if they were sitting, if someone's sitting on your work for a month or two, you're in the maybe pile. And during the Carver, Ray Carver years, there would be a lot of stories in the maybe pile that were trying to imitate Carver. So, so you would saw, see so many stories that were, were tributes or like Carver's work. Yeah. And a lot of those, well, this is good enough if I don't get that story from somebody else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm waiting for Vonnegut, you know, I mean, so. <laughs> And if Monica doesn't send me work, then I'll take this story. And that, right. that's the way I think that works with a lot of magazines mm -hmm. um, that are sitting on the work. Mm -hmm. um, and we do sit on some stories where we think, well, maybe. Let's see what else comes in. Um, and I don't know, maybe 10% of that gets in, sneaks in somehow. Mm -hmm. um, and I often say that there's a fourth pile, which is the work that's so bad, you can read it out loud and everyone laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> um, and I don't know about everybody else, but I know that these days, almost everything I get is, is online, submittable. Um, and I only get, a, I think this last issue, we had four submissions by a post office. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, it's completely disappearing. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people who don't have computers. And I know there are people who are older and can't handle it for whatever issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I just, I see more and more magazines saying, you know, we won't only read email submissions. Yeah. And that's just the way it's going. Mm -hmm. um, a question here, wondering what you think of eBooks. Um, I have, you know, I'm the kind of person who reads billboards, you know, I mean, I, you know, ads, anything laying on the table with print on it, I read it, you know, I just, <laughs> I see it all. And I, and I try to, um, I don't have a problem reading eBooks. Um, 
I have people asking me for eBooks uh, to publish their work in eBooks um, because we did a print version and we will get to it. But again, I'm not tech and uh, it requires me to lean on other people and ask and beg. And uh, so it will happen. And usually I wouldn't do an eBook until like a year after the print book because some people just want to back up for it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but do I buy things in ebook format? Oh, absolutely. I bought, I don't know, thousands of books and, uh, particularly nonfiction for me, um, because it's usually really chunky and I, I, you know, it's an investment uh, and, uh, and plus my wife says I'm a hoarder. So <laughs> I have to, have to get rid of books too. Um, and that's hard uh, as somebody who does this. I mean, I, oh my God, you know, 1970s issue of, you know, Clay Pigeon, I gotta have, you know, it's like, <laughs> uh, you know, I gotta have it. Uh, it's, it's hard. I mean, I think one of the reasons I started the magazine is I was much of a fanboy of writers as, you know, trying to be one. Um, and I haven't lost that fanboy attitude. I can still be in a room with you know, a, a really big star. And I'm just like, oh, you know, um, it's like the Beatles. <laughs> um, and that's cool. I, I, I'm glad that I haven't lost that actually. It, it, it makes me shyer than I want to be, but it's cool. Mm -hmm. I like writers it's, and I like books and it's what it's all about for me. Yeah. Um, just a clarification question. Which website is the new one? I will link to it when I post it. Which website is the right one? <laughs> um, the one that doesn't say this website is about to disappear. Um, <laughs> uh, it's uh, gargoylepaycock.wordpress.com is the up and running website. Mm -hmm. The other one, we're just cannibalizing and stealing you know, our stuff from to move to the other one. Um, but it has to end soon because so many people are confused and it's, you know, of course I, nothing on the web ever really goes away. So I don't know how you actually shut that down. I think um, if your domain expires, then they just shut it down, but otherwise it will just stay there. Be there. Yeah. yeah. But it has been distracting a lot of people because I can't buy the new issue. Right. Like, well, it distracted me because I think it's the first one that comes up when you do a search for Gargoyle magazine. And um, doesn't that figure? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, this feels old school. And I, oh. yeah. Um, yeah. So when will you be open again for submissions? Uh, June 1st, oh, okay. 22. Okay. Um, but we took this year off because of the backup. Right. I mean, the last thing I want to do is make more people wait. Um, and it's, that's, it's hard. I mean, I, you know, that's the frustration. Mm -hmm. But soon. <laughs> and so when you're reading Fingers submissions, is it, is it only you reading submissions or do you have? No, I have a, I, I read most of the work from people I know. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a lot of uh, people I've never heard of who come through submittable. And I have, uh, it's been an interesting group of people. It's kind of rotated through the years. Um, it's almost all women because mm -hmm. guys don't want to do it, I guess. Um, um, and there are some, I mean, Abby Frucht uh, was one of our readers last time around. She's has many books out, mm -hmm. wonderful writer. And I think I can see how it would help people see what's actually coming in and help you assess what people are writing now to do that. So for some, it's sort of educational. I think that they do it to see like, well, why am I getting nowhere? And why are these other people being published? And, you know, it's, it, it is a helpful step, I think. Um, no one gets paid. It's strictly, you know, and because we read like a blitzkrieg, you know, it's just, you know, a week or two, you know, here, here are your hundred stories. Let me know in a couple of days. I mean, it, it's wow. kind of like uh, summer school in an MFA program. <laughs> it's like, you're going to read a lot. Um, so yeah, but, but it, uh, they have guided me to people who I would have missed and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure they've read a lot of bad work too, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, uh, I think I can find something good in almost anybody, but, uh, it's, uh, it's hard in, in the old days I read everything and it's it just, the numbers just keep going up. So you yeah. can't. 
And you mentioned you read the work first by people you know. Are these works that you have solicited or it's just friends? That, that For, well, I've been doing this long enough that I know I know you. <laughs> a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, people we've published before kind of get first dibs um, oh, okay. in the reading. And I don't always take their work because, mm -hmm. you know, eh, don't like this one. And, and that's hard because mm -hmm. I, I like the whole relationship. Um, business. Um, I think, uh, you know, I just, uh, people I'm aware of, people, yeah. you know, also people I've never met or don't know who, mm -hmm. oh, I know that name, you know, wonder why they're sending me work. Okay, let's look. Um, and that's not to, you know, you know, I do read everything by the end. And in fact, I, by the time I publish something, it's been read three or four times by me alone, because I have to be able to live with it. Um, it's, it's a funny thing when it's, you know, your money, uh, you kind of start, uh, it's like buying a couch. Can I have that couch sitting in my living room? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and sometimes you, the initial glow wears off. You can't, mm. you know? but I like to think that you can read that work over and over again and get something new. Mm -hmm. Woo. Uh, <laughs> So uh, what do you think of literary journal rankings um, and how well, we never get ranked. They don't rank us. So I, I saw I saw one of those like last week and, yeah. and we were ranked like 300 because we don't pay. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, OK, we published Nick Cave. Come on. Right. Did you really? really? I, done I, didn't, that. I didn't know that. That's really cool. I mean, we've published Nick Cave. We published uh, uh, God, and in the minute you do that, your mind goes blank. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Richard Hell, you published Richard Hell. Okay. Uh, yeah. The uh, British punk poet Jules, yeah. Yeah. he's wonderful. Uh, Kathy Acker, mm -hmm. you know, we just, we're all over the place. Yeah. Um, we did, uh, we had posted an interview with John Gardner, which was awesome back in the day. Um, I really liked him, nice guy. Um, Allen Ginsberg, you know, so we, we published and then we, we, you know, we've discovered some people too. Mm -hmm. Maxine Claire was, um, uh, published early on in Gargoyle. Yeah. Um, I, uh, started reading, um, names gone, but, pff, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Someone, yeah. Someone, somebody. Yeah, I mean, I always tell writers, I think the rankings are important. If you're new to submitting and you're just trying to get like a lay of the land and you can see, you know, okay, this magazine has published in Best American Short Stories a number of times and this magazine, you know, um, you get a sense of how competitive the journals might be and you get a sense mm. of how, um, how many people are submitting to them and sort of like what they're perceived uh, reputation is in the literary community, but as a writer, those magazines might not be right for you. Um, and you might decide you really like the aesthetic of Gargoyle and you just, you know, you think it's really cool, even though you haven't seen it on a particular so-and-so's ranking of, you know, top 15 journals or whatever. So I, I think the rankings are important as sort of objective measures of things, but they are very subjective and if you find a magazine like gargoyle that fits your aesthetic and fits you know what you're about um that's great i um i think things have really changed mm -hmm. um you know when when we started out the indie world was very separate um almost the the way the indie world and music was we we're very separate from the new york world and that has shifted closer together now so there's more sort of overlap in the center mm -hmm. um i mean for me the big presses were were coffee house and black sparrow and capra and uh city lights and new directions and those were the places that i was interested in um but of course we i did a mondo series for uh saint martin's and we liked saint martin's and we were we were given a, uh back in the days when they bid on things we were in a bidding war between St. Martin's and one of the giant corporations. And we just thought, we'll go with St. Martin's because they're smaller. And that was our thinking. And, um, you know, we, 
we were successful enough. We did four books with them and, uh, and that was a lot of fun again. Um, and I just, now would they even do something like that? I don't know. I mean, those were very risky, strange books we published with them. Yeah. Um, we did a book with high risk, um, which was a, um, I think their penultimate book that before they were enveloped in something else. I, I just don't know, but I, but I, what I see is even poets and writers has shifted from the days when it was all about the indie people to mm -hmm. the people who are selling their works and making chunks of change. And you're like, wow, the focus has moved. Um, that's interesting to me that there's been a sort of generational shift yeah. in how writers and poets are observed. Uh, you know, it's interesting so i've never i'm not and never have been a person who thinks oh they won that award that's cool mm -hmm. you know because so much of that i i don't really know what it's based on anymore because mm -hmm. there's work that people think is great that i don't think is great mm -hmm. and then of course there's work i love that they wouldn't even bother to read and i think that's you know i think there's room for all of that so mm -hmm. i i don't know that you know when i was in grad school, uh, the departments would never take the writing program seriously because they were interested in people who had books out hmm. and the writing programs were people who were writing. So who cares about that? It was a very interesting demarcation. Hmm. And, uh, and I think one of the things that could or is happening because of COVID is that the universities are gonna look at the university lit mags and go, why are we funding this? Hmm. Um, and I think the departments are shrinking. Um, it's, it's there, I mean, there are going to be some big changes coming. I'm just not sure that the marriage of the indie world and the, and the mainstream uh, publishing world is going to work out. Hmm. Um, anyway. Yeah. Do you see that reflected in the style of writing? That's kind of a big, broad question. but. Um, because I, I too sort of think of lit mags in the olden days as being more part of a counterculture. Yeah, uh, you, sort of we were against like corporate, you know, mainstream publishing and just not really having any connection to that world. Um, and, and I'm wondering if, if you're seeing more of a fusion between those, if, if it's reflected in the writing that gets submitted or the kinds of writing that gets published. Well, it could be that the editorial staffs are changing. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I mean, the, the publishing, the New York publishing world has always been sort of a Baroque uh, establishment in that, yeah. you know, in there, there are paid copy editors who, you know, there are steps that everything has to go through. And there's hundreds of people employed, whereas, you know, yeah. you or I could take a manuscript to a print on demand shop and have a book in our hands, mm -hmm. you know, an hour. That's, a humongous change, but they're not doing that. Though I know that Ingram, the lightning source part of Ingram um, is do printing books for Oxford University now because those thick critical books aren't gonna stay in print. So it's a way to keep copies around if people want them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, I'm old, who knows what's gonna happen in the next <laughs> 10 or 20 years. Uh, it, I mean, it could all completely change. Mm -hmm. I mean, there I was last night giving away CDs and one of the guys went, oh, this is great, but I don't have a way to play it. And I yeah. went, yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. So I'm an antique. There you yeah. go. Um, um, there's a question here, and I think this is one that often comes up with literary magazines. Will there be more writers than readers in this space? I think it's already happened. Yeah. Um, and I think when uh, when you send someone a magazine, most people only read their own work. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if Sherman Alexi has a poem in there, cool, I'll read that. You know. Yeah. And I've 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 been doing this long enough that I also realized that you know poets often say to me, "Hey, I read all the poems in the issue," because like you don't read fiction. Okay, got it. Um, 
so the days of people doing, you know, being literary in a sense where they read it all yeah. are over. And I didn't expect that um, because I write it all. I do all that stuff and I, you know, I read it all. And I just, maybe you have to be completely focused as a poet to make it in the poetry ladder um, and vice versa. Um, the blending of the genres is interesting in fiction because who knows anymore? I mean, a big time crime writer, if he doesn't have a little sci-fi in there, you know, is, is that going to work out? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, and I think all that stuff is up for grabs now. I mean, I think it, it will change a lot with the writers who are 20 now, what they're going to do in the next 20 years. I think it, it will be very different. Mm -hmm. I hope so. I hope it's very different. Um, but the publishing world, um, I mean, people have said for a long time that it needed to grow up and change. And I think change is working on an editorial level now, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's working on a you know, process level yeah. of the, the production. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it will, I don't know. So how do you find readers? Are you ever open? Uh, for do you ever put out a call for readers? Or I've never had to. People just write me and go, "Hey, I'd like to read some slush." <laughs> so, oh. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. anyone who's watching this interview, if they send you an email and say, "I'd like to get involved," "I'd like to volunteer as a reader," um, is that an invitation? Uh, sure, I can bury you in stuff <laughs> starting next June first. I okay. can bury you. Um, I'll include uh, your email because it, it's true. <laughs> It's true. And because we operate quickly, you don't have a month to read them all. Mm. You have a week or two weeks. <clears throat> and that's daunting. A lot of people go, well, you know, I got I have kids and a job. And, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, as long as you're going to do them in a week, we're good. <clears throat> and that's that's difficult. Um, what I like to do is I have because I have a bunch of readers I can rotate. Um, OK, these five poems are going to these two readers. And if both of them say, then I don't look bother to look at it. Um, if if it's mixed, you know, there, um, then I try to give it to a third reader. Um, if I get two no's, I pretty much say no. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's just time. I don't have time to go through, you know, a couple thousand submissions. No, I don't have that time anymore. Um, and I, I'm no big shot. I can't imagine what big shots go through, <laughs> uh, you know, but, I, but I have, you know, I have two daughters and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, too many pets and God <laughs> knows. Uh, so there's always, you know, a trip to the vet or the car died or something, yeah. just life happens. In your own writing, you're a poet as well. And a fiction writer. Um, yeah, I need time to do that. And, mm -hmm. I, and my time in the last year and a half is just, I mean, honestly, um, I've written very little since November 2016. Mm -hmm. um, I've just just rocked my world to an extent that I haven't been able to function pretty much. Mm -hmm. and I think that's impacted everything. Um, I have started writing again. I'm, I've been sending a lot of poems out all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. um, it takes me time to process what's going on. Yeah. And that's why I'm always leery of, you know, two days after 9-11, people are writing poems and I'm like, uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, that's weird, you know, to me. Yeah. Uh, the like ambulance chaser poems. Uh, yeah. And then maybe you, maybe, you know, I can see how you could be impacted personally, and that would make you put it on paper to try to make sense of it. But mm -hmm. I, but it's tough for me to accept poets doing that um, at instant, instant poems. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not really there. Um, and McMurtry, Larry McMurtry, who lived in DC for a long time and had a bookstore here, he said that uh, it took him 10 years to process stuff too. And that, and that stuck with me. Um, he ran a workshop at Georgetown University back when I was just graduating. And I hung out at that. And he gave one of those lines at the beginning, which was pretty much, you know, um, most of the people in this room and you know maybe two of you will get published and, and, and you know, that made me mad I was like what you know <laughs> um and it but it throws down the gauntlet because you realize most people are going to quit um I had a workshop at the writer center um where 
you know, I, everyone talked about the story and everyone had suggestions and they were really good ideas and the story was not perfect. And the woman broke down and started crying. And uh, she was 40s, she was in her 40s. And she started crying and she goes, you know, I took, I workshop this at Iowa, I did this, I did that, you know, I know these writers and, they, you know, when will it be perfect? And I'm like, you know, it'll never be perfect. Yeah. If, if you've done all that, just send it out. Mm -hmm. Just let it go, write something else. I mean, if the, if the characters are still talking to you, it's not done, mm -hmm. but send it out, you know, just try it. Yeah. There's, you know, and she quit hmm. and you're like, okay. And then I had a guy tell me that, you know, tell me whether this sucks or not, I can take it. And I, so I took it home and I red penned it and I brought it back and I said, yeah, it needs a lot of work. And he, yeah. he quit Aww. because, and he quit writing. Cause yeah. I, you know, okay, I, I don't have it. Based on what, right. and, as, a, as Richard Grayson, who was one of the first people under 30 who got published a lot in the 70s um, and uh, was a friend of mine. Uh, he said that it was so weird because he was not the best writer in his programs when he was going through them. And the best writers didn't get in the Paris Review or the New Yorker and they quit. Mm. Wow. He was in the mid-level, mid-range, he thought. Yeah. But he never quit. So he would get books out. I mean, it's, it's, it's not... Not everyone is suited to live this life. And I think that's true in all the arts, whether you're a painter or musician. Or, my God, the competition will kill you. You're, just, you're not really competing with anybody but yourself. And they don't understand that. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, I, I wish everybody luck here. Um, <laughs> and if you really do want to read manuscripts, I can hook you up. Uh, it's just, it, it, just seems endless when you realize how many people are writing and frustrated mm -hmm. and angry. And, and I, there was a, I, a Saturday night, night live skit from early on after Chevy Chase had left. And I think he was only on one year, right? And they said, why were you successful? And he said, because I fucked the camera. Just, and there was a skit the next year, I think Steve Martin was a guest host and, and there's like, four of the great comedians standing around talking. And some of the younger comedians from Saturday Night Live are over to the side and they're going, God, what funny comedians are they talking about? What jokes are they telling? Mm -hmm. And then you cut to them and they're going, and you got three points on that bit? Yeah, well, they didn't give me $100,000. <laughs> and it was all about the money. Right. And I thought, and that's the biz. Right. That totally the biz, no right. matter how high you are up on the ladder, you're still complaining about it. Mm -hmm. And I've lived long enough now to see people go up the ladder and then they come back down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's fascinating. Yeah. They come back down and they're all upset and, and unhappy about it, but no one stays on the ladder. Mm -hmm. Just the way it works. So the indie press, psh, no ladders, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I um, wish you all luck and good things as you go forward with this whole supply chain drama and waiting <laughs> for paper and waiting for trucks and um do you have a sense of like when things might start rolling for the next issue uh well we should be sending gallons out before the end of this month and i was hoping to have it out in october mm -hmm. number 74 but you're right. It's so waiting for the paper. It's like waiting for Godot. You know, <laughs> that's where we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Such a mess. Well, uh, yeah, I hope it all goes speedy and smooth <laughs> from here on yeah. out. <laughs> thank you. And thanks Bye, so everybody. much for taking the time. Thanks for hanging out. <laughs>